Welcome back to Tonight Live. I'm Dan Wilson and it is time for Uncancelled, where Britain's top commentators speak out on controversial issues without the fear of the cancel culture sweeping the rest of the media. And one part of society impacted more than most by that culture is our universities. This week, we learned that the Oxford University Students' Union is planning to employ sensitivity readers. These so-called moral guardians will scrutinise articles in its famous university newspaper, Cherwell, before publication to make sure they won't offend anyone. The Spectator's associate editor, Toby Young, explores this worrying move in a brilliant new piece for The Spectator magazine today, saying he dreads to think what the reaction of this snow patrol would be to some of the student journalism he produced when he was studying at Oxford alongside Boris Johnson. He writes, I like to think there's still a place for waspish, opinionated journalists with a strong, rebellious streak, an instinctive distrust of officialdom, and a complete indifference to social approval. Unfortunately, they're unlikely to learn their trade at Oxford these days. And as the General Secretary of the Free Speech Union, Toby argues that student leaders should be standing up for the rights of journalists, not trying to muzzle them. Toby Young, it's great to have you on the show. It was a fascinating piece today. I guess your two worlds colliding, given your history uh, in student journalism at Oxford University and your new role as the boss of the Free Speech Union. What on earth has happened at Oxford? I know, it, uh, it's extraordinary, Dan. The last time I went to speak to a group of Oxford students, which was a couple of years ago, um, my wife told me, whatever you do, don't call them snowflakes. You know, that's not a grown up way to engage them politically. It's like them calling you a gammon. You know, try and be a bit more mature. But <laughs> by God, they make it hard, Dan. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, just when you thought we'd reach peak woke and students couldn't get any more ridiculous, you know, uh, jazz hands instead of clapping. Um, now we're told that um, the Oxford University Students Union has appointed a, and this is their word, a consultancy of sensitivity readers, whose job will be to vet the work of student journalists uh, to make sure that nothing they say is problematic or insensitive, because that apparently could cause untold mental trauma uh, to students. I mean, if I was a student at Oxford today, I'd be quite annoyed at the thought that my union thinks I'm so delicate, so fragile, that it needs to appoint sensitivity readers to protect me from reading something that might trigger me, that might that might you know might cause me mental distress. You know, isn't the reason you go to university to be challenged, to uh, be provoked, to engage in heated disputes, to get drunk in the college bar and have a roaring argument? The idea that students are these delicate plants now that have to be protected from any sort of aggression or hostility, any challenge whatsoever, and that that will be good for their mental health. I mean, what are they going to be like when they when they go into the outside world and have to deal with, you know, an ordinary workplace? It's just so misguided. Absolutely. Because let's be honest, Toby, the news is challenging and triggering. But but it's important that it exists because otherwise we wouldn't know about genocides and war and rapes. And, and it just does fascinate me that university students don't seem to be able to handle it. Well, I think um, reading between the lines of um, this latest move, Dan, mm. um, you know, there's always a covert political agenda under the guise of protecting the mental health of students. Uh, what they're really going to be doing, these sensitivity readers, is going to be censoring any non-woke content. And they won't be censoring it overtly on political grounds. They'll be censoring it on the grounds that it might trigger people, it might upset them, it might, it might, it might uh, impede on their delicate sensibilities. But actually, you know, if, if they publish stuff which is insensitive about conservatives, or pale, male, uh, stale folk like us. I don't suppose the sensitivity readers will mind in the slightest. Uh, so I think that under the guise of uh, protecting these snowflake students, what it's really about is censoring any non-woke content in student newspapers like Charwell. 
Um, uh, you know, and, and that's what's really sinister about it. Effectively, it's appointing a panel of censors. The person who decides what's going to appear in Charwell, the older student newspaper at Oxford now, won't be the editor. Uh, you know, he'll he'll have to approve something and then send it up the line to these sensitivity readers, like, like you know, North Korea. A, a, a producer in the West End in the 1960s, having to get the approval of the Lord Chamberlain before he can put on a play. Uh, you know, and it, 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 the, the editor of Charwell will now have to get the approval of these little Lord Chamberlains, you know, sitting above him. Uh, and if, if they disapprove of the, of the political thrust of an article, they'll say, sorry, it doesn't pass the sensitivity test. And that's what's really sinister about it, I think. It is, it is, because if, I mean, if you extrapolate this out and, and you actually take it uh, very seriously, this is what the, the China, Chinese Communist government is doing with newspapers in Hong Kong. I mean, obviously, we've seen them shut down Apple Daily this week, but, but it's essentially sensitivity readers that are looking and monitoring the content. It just feels like... Um, these woke university students are so puritanical. That's what I don't understand. Yeah, there is there is a strong streak of puritanism running through this. Um, and I think that uh, one way of understanding, I think, the woke quasi-religious cult is that it's a cyclical resurgence of uh, puritanism. You know, uh, it's the same... Um, uh, uh, virus, if you like, that infected America in the McCarthy era. It's the same virus that infected China during the Cultural Revolution in the late 1960s. It's the same virus that was at large in Massachusetts um, in, 17th in the 17th century, um, which led to witch hunts. Um, and in England before that, um, uh, during the English Civil War, uh, you know, from time to time, in the Anglosphere, we seem to undergo these bouts of puritanical hysteria in which we need to expel um, various toxins from polite society, excommunicate them, cast them out, because merely uh, being in contact with them is going to contaminate us in some way. And this is sort of under this. The, the, you, you get that from the word sensitivity and sensitivity reader. It's as though they are attuned to uh, these um, toxins that are going to pollute the stu student life if they're allowed at large in newspapers. So they have to be expelled. They have to be pushed out in order to protect the purity, the moral integrity of, uh, of the student community. It's bizarre. And uh, the hope is that it will, you know, that this madness will eventually pass. But every time we think we've reached peak woke, uh, it just gets worse. Yeah, no, it does. Now, now Toby, uh, tell us a little bit about what it was like for you as a student journalist at Oxford in the 80s alongside lots of famous people, including our current Prime Minister. Uh, your content, I believe, was anything but woke. That's right, Dan. Um, uh, I remember I, I edited um, a, a magazine at Oxford called Tributary, which was the Oxford equivalent of Private Eye. It was a satirical, gossipy uh, magazine which came out three or four times a term. And I remember when we discovered that Boris Johnson, who was a big man on campus, as you can imagine, uh, was going out with this um, beautiful undergraduate called Allegra Mostyn Owen. She was the, the girl that everybody lusted after. Her picture had been on the front cover of Harper's and Queen. She was brilliant. She was aristocratic, rich, beautiful, unattainable for troglodytes like me. And um, I remember when Boris suddenly started going out with her and she was at, she was at Trinity College and I put a picture of her on page three of Tributary and ran the headline Allegra Austin Rover, a smooth little runner from Trinity. And um, I can't imagine that that would get past the sensitivity readers today. I mean, our, no. our attitude to journalism, and as you say, there, there were plenty of um, people who, who now dominate British public life, who were my contemporaries at the time. You know, Michael Gobe was there, uh, Simon Stevens just about to step down as the chief executive of the NHS, Ed Balls was there. Um, uh, uh, it was extraordinary how many people, Neil Ferguson, the American journalist, 
Andrew Sullivan, lots of contributors now to The Spectator, Aidan Hartley, Lloyd Evans, uh, Rachel Johnson, Boris's sister. We were all student journalists together. Uh, but you know, our sensitivity extended to working out whatever was likely to embarrass one another the most and then repeating it at every conceivable opportunity. I remember my nickname in Charwell uh, was based on a particularly nasty venereal disease. And that was par for the course. It was absolutely brutal. And as such, the perfect training for a career on Fleet Street. Well, Tony, I'm just going to bring up my panel in on this. We've got Dominique Samuels, Constantine Kisson and Andrew Doyle here. Andrew Doyle, you are obviously a free speech advocate. Uh, this is shocking development, right, from Oxford? Yeah, I think, I think what a lot of people don't know is that sensitivity readers and the concept of sensitivity readers is actually really common in the publishing industry now. Uh, it started off more common in youth fiction, and now, and now it's, it's fairly standard. So even uh, uh, an adult author who submitted a book can, in some cases, have this vetted uh, by some unknown entity who's going to decide whether they have represented certain groups in the right way. And, and that, can, that can apply to fiction, where, of course, you know, the, the artist's prerogative is key. So this, this is something that's happening more and more. And it's just sort of narrowing the field of what, is, what are acceptable forms of expression. This is particularly worrying. Uh, for student journalism, where, where people are trying to find their voice. But what they don't want to be doing is ending up replicating a singular voice. Otherwise, it's just like the Borg, and everyone is speaking in the same way. Yeah. Dominique, these are your contemporaries. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> what, what's happened to, to your generation? I don't know. I, I despair over every single day. I mean, obviously, I'm not surprised. This is a road that st students in particular seem to be going down. Um, and I think it's worrying because it greatly stifles freedom of choice, obviously, because, you know, you should be able to choose the words that you use. Um, obviously, you shouldn't use words that are, you know, deliberately offensive in terms of them being, you know, directly hate hateful or threatening towards anyone else. I think that's just a given. But the danger with things like sensitivity readers is they are greatly based upon one's personal perception of what reality is and what constitutes offence. And that's where the lines become increasingly blurred. And I think for students, you know, we want constantly to see things through the lens of race, to see things through the lens of oppression, because partly I feel like we're just bored and trying to find things to complain about. But I do think that this has really great impacts on freedom of speech in general, especially because we as students are going to be going into society and eventually, you know, leading our society. So I think it's yeah. very frightening for what's to come. No, it is. It's very frightening for what's to come. Toby Young, just finally, uh, any student journalists at Oxford, members of the Free Speech Union, you know, do they need to be? Uh, we, I think we do have a couple of um, student journalists at Oxford who are members of the Free Speech Union. There, there are at least two free speech societies now at Oxford. Um, one of the initiatives of the Free Speech Union in partnership with the um, Institute of Ideas has been to set up something called the Free Speech Champions Programme, which are young people, predominantly students, out there advocating for free speech, trying to impress upon their fellow students why it's important and why they should care about it and why student journalists shouldn't submit their work to be censored by sensitivity readers. Um, and um, we've now got, I think, uh, uh, 13 free speech societies that have been set up at different universities across the country. So I think there is a fight back, Dan. You know, there is an attempt to push back against this climate of intolerance and censoriousness, which is sweeping Britain's campuses. And um, I think one source of hope is that the new generation entering university this September seem to be uh, much more willing to take risks, much less willing to be muzzled by these uh, campus morality cops. You're seeing, I think, a bit of a fight back, which uh, well, we're doing our happen. best to encourage. It needs to happen. Toby Young, thank you so much. It's a brilliant piece in The Spectator this week. Must read and do come back for another Uncancelled soon.